moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. To Jesus Christ I fled for rest, he bade me cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties, Above the fruited plain America, America God shed His grace on thee And crowned thy good with brotherhood From sea to shining sea Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stem in passion stress, a thorough fair for freedom be across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self control, liberty. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster city's gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining
beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam God bless America my home sweet home God bless America my home sweet home If you could see what I once was If you could go with me Back to where I started from Then I know you would see A miracle of love that took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today just an old sinner saved by grace I'm just a sinner stood condemned to death he took my place now I live and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take I'm loved and forgiven I'm back with the God not brought me gently to this place I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace I'm just a sinner stood condemned to death he took my place now I live and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take I'm loved and forgiven back with the Just a sinner saved by grace. Now I live and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. I'm loved and forgiven. 
I'm back with the living. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Saved by grace. Well, we live in America, the greatest country in the world. I'm glad I'm American. And I wanted to speak on the subject of America's greatest threat. Uh, we're living in difficult times. All you have to do is read your newspaper. And uh, our society is uh, really coming apart. Um, and it makes you wonder, is this the same land that you've lived in very long? And I want to talk to you about that today. Um, all right, America's greatest threat, Hosea chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 6. Often we can liken uh, Israel to America or America to Israel. As God dealt with Israel as an example, we can certainly look at our own country and say if this is the way God dealt with Israel, certainly God will deal with us the same way. Um, they were his chosen people, raised them up for a reason. All he did was ask them to follow him and obey his laws. And, that they, he, that, and the reason for this is so that the world could see God through the children of Israel. We can't see God. So God wants to reveal himself somehow to people. Now he does it through... Uh, the planets and through nature and and so on, but uh, and same thing with today. God wants to show forth Christ through you and I, so that Christ can be seen, God can be seen in your life and my life, and that's why we're still here. This is so people can see God, know God, come to understand God through us. The children of Israel did not always do that. They disobeyed. And in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. It's not because they were not smart. They were very intelligent people. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. And because of that, I will also reject them. Well, reject thee. And thou shalt... Be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. David says it another way in Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. The gravest mistake was to enjoy God's blessing only to forget him. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll speak to our hearts today. Give us understanding, even in the day in which we live, how you operate, what you expect. And Father, I just pray that once again you can bless America. We thank you for the blessings of the past. Help us to do our part in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What is a threat? Well, the word itself means it's the attention to inflict evil, injury, or damage on a person or a place. A threat. It's the intention to inflict evil, injury, or damage. I'll, I'll give you three, four points today, and you'll have my message. Number one, there are major threats even today to America, the very country which we live, where we're bringing up our children and our grandchildren. We're hoping, of course, for years uh, of, of peace, prosperity, blessing upon our country. But there are major threats to America. Let me mention a few. Number one are foreign powers. You read the newspaper. You uh, watch the television. 
You see that North Korea certainly is a major player as a threat to America as well as uh, countries close by them. They're a threat to the world because they have certain powers and, and they can inflict such great damage and, on, on people and, and kill millions of people if they wanted to. And so they're a threat. China is a threat. They have tremendous power as well. Russia has tremendous power, can be a threat to America as well as the world. And certainly Iran has been in the news for a number of years. They, uh, they publicly broadcast death to the great Satan, which is America. They hate us and uh, would love to just destroy us. They'd love to destroy you. Uh, and so there's a, a, a looming threat from world powers they don't like us and are willing to do whatever is necessary to destroy us. Then there's the globalist. We face a threat by the globalist. Who are they? They want a new world order. And well, what's a new world order? They view running the world as you would run our, a country or run a business. Instead of having China have their government and somebody else having their government and our government, why not just have a world government that runs the world? And that's the way they see it. They're tired of just running one country and running another country. Let's just run the world. And so the globalists see the world as that. It's a group of powerful, rich individuals who would make rules for all the world. They'd have a world police presence that would enforce the laws that they would set up for the world. They'd have a world army which would be able to crush any rebellion to it. They'd have a world bank that would control who's able to do business and who's not. They would also allow a world religion that rejects Christianity but embraces the worship of an antichrist and we see that even in the book of Revelation. Let's take a second and look at the book of Revelation, chapter 13, for just a second. Because this is the goal of the globalist. A lot of people say, well, what's wrong with that? Why, won't, why is it bad to have a world army and a world bank and a world... Just have a group of people running the world. The problem with it is... Man has a sin nature, and they cannot handle the power. You know, I'm not sure, but what happens in Revelation would have happened at the Tower of Babel had God not intervened. Because once you get a world group, because that's all there was at the Tower of Babel, they were all gathered together. They were going to make a tower that reached into heaven. They were going to make a name for themselves. Nimrod was uh, uh, very active at that time. And who's to say that they would not have already, thousands of years earlier, brought this to pass? But God looked down and says, I'm going to scatter them throughout the world so they can't do this. But they will do it at the end time. And we see it recorded in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon, of course, is Satan, which gave power unto the beast, which, of course, is the Antichrist. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him, to continue 40 and two months. Now let me pause. That's three and a half years that the Antichrist will rule with a, with a rod of iron. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven even. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not 
written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now this is, whatever, the, whatever their goal is, this is the way it's going to conclude. Now we know this is going to happen. The globalists are going to win at a point. Right now we are enjoying a window of God's grace in America. God has some reason delayed this. We're getting very close to it. They're fighting for this world domination, this one world order, and they'll bring in all the positive aspects of it. They will not have to have war anymore. We won't, we'll just have a world army that will put down any force and rebellion and so on and so forth, and it's going to be wonderful. The problem is we have the Bible that tells us how it turns out. And that is that evil rises to the top of it and total control. Satan takes it over. You become a slave. I become a slave. And you worship him. And he gives you the authority whether you can buy or sell. If you don't worship him, he takes away your power to even exist. So that's what's wrong with the program. There's flaws in it, and the Christian sees it. And so there's this threat to America of globalism. Many of the young people coming up today do not see that threat. They just say, hey, it sounds like a good system. I'll just take a mark, and, man, I'll just do business and buy my groceries. It seems cool. They need to read their Bible because we see how evil takes it over. And it is going to happen. It's already recorded. So we know that the globalists do win for a while because the Bible tells us and that the Antichrist will rule and reign at least three and a half years uh, and he'll rise to power the first three and a half years. So his existence is going to be at least a seven-year period. America is on life support right now while God continues to extend grace to this great country. And I hope that you and I enjoy this, and at the same time, stay close to God, and live for God, that God could once again bless America. Thirdly, America is under siege by non-believers who feel threatened by the knowledge of God's word. There's a group of unbelievers out there. There's a lot of them. And they love their freedom to sin. To the point they refuse to be corrected by God's holy laws. They're responsible for the moral decline of America. Much of it. See, it's that group of people who fought to forbid prayer in public schools. They forbid the reading of the Bible in school. They forbid the Ten Commandments to be in our school, or even in government institutions. They forbid Christmas carols in school. They forbid the sharing of Jesus Christ with fellow students. They forbid the study of creation in school. They forbid Bible clubs in schools. They even forbid preachers and others to quote scripture publicly that they feel is offensive to their way of life. They don't like it. And they will do everything in their power to stop it. They want to forbid businesses to conduct their business according to their faith. They hate the word of God that much. They forbid chaplains in the ministry to even pray in Jesus' name. We could continue the list, but you get the picture. There are unbelievers who are hostile to Christianity. That is a threat to our great country. You talk about a phobia. They're fearful of God's word. They fight with all their power to stamp out the knowledge of God. And they've made great inroads. Christianity, uh, they're stymieing it every point that they can. We don't want the word of God getting to kids, children. We want to stop it. It's offensive. It's hateful. 
But all the while, they're a threat. There's this underlying threat that's eating away at our rights and our Christianity in America. So in spite of the threats of foreign powers, the globalists, even the unbelieving effort to stamp out God's word, God tells us, in spite of all of that, the greatest threat to America is Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. It's God's people. His people. What? With all these outside threats and battles that are fought every day, God says, the problem is, Christian, you failed to do what you should do to keep this thing going. Israel, you had all the truth in the world. You had the prophets. You had the word of God. These prophets wrote the Bible. You had it all, and yet you failed to live it. Matter of fact, not only did you lack knowledge, you rejected it. You said, God, I don't even want it. Wow. So America's greatest threat, I believe, is the threat when God's people reject God's word by living as though God does not even exist. And God looks down at this and says, how can this be? How can this be? Well, we forget God when we call ourselves Christians only to participate in a few religious exercises but live our lives as though God doesn't exist. And it goes on all the time. Oh, they go through a few Christian exercises. But as far as their lifestyle is concerned, God is not in charge of their life. And God knows that. And God sees that. We forget God when our priorities allow every personal interest to come before our worship and service to God. God sees that. He knows that. Israel did the same thing. Oh, they made some lip service to, to God. But the fact is their priorities was totally out of line. God and his worship and his service came last in their lives. We forget God when we stop praying for and witnessing to our family and friends. We forget God when we're no longer interested in what his word says to us. We forget God when the philosophy and culture of this world shape our attitude and our behavior more than God's word does. We see that all the time. People who are Christians are living as though they've never been changed. They're living like they lived when they were lost. The Bible still says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're, he's in the transforming business. And God says, why have you not only... You have access to the knowledge, but why would you reject it? We forget God when the act of sin no longer strikes guilt and shame into our hearts. We forget God when feeding on his word loses its appeal and interest in our lives. I'm saying to you, America is under attack. And if Christians would come to grips with this thing and understand. God says, I need you to stand. I want you to stand tall. I want you to stand strong. I want you to believe in me and live for me. I ask myself, how could such a threat exist in America? How could such a, a, a threat exist in America? How does a country like America get to the place where they would forget God who has so abundantly blessed them. You'd have to ask yourself the same question. How do we get here? It's so easy to blame the next guy, blame Washington, 
blame these unbelievers who are battling us and trying to stop the Word of God. Certainly, you know, they, they, they have a part in it. But God says, it's my people. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. And because of that, I will also reject thee, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. Let me give you, and I'll put them up on the screen, because we have to ask ourselves the question, how did we get here? How could that happen? Have I? Am I part of that? Somehow, have I weakened the fabric of Christianity in America so that God can no longer bless us? Number one, Christians fail by losing their desire for biblical truth. They fail by losing their desire for biblical truth. Christians become indifferent to God's word and begin to give it little attention in their lives. We, have to, we're, we all have to guard. I'm saying to you, Christians, we're not here to condemn anybody. We're, I'm pointing these things out to us so we can guard this. Because it's so easy. Satan has so many things out there to preoccupy us and to distract us from the very thing that's important. You've rejected my word, God says. How can it be? Well, ask yourself, how important is the word of God to you? Really? And we always think, well, it's not that. Be careful, that's part of the problem. We become indifferent. It's just not important. And God says, I'm going to forget you just as you have forgotten me. It is that important. This is why we have the Awana program. We're teaching children the word of God. There's nothing more important to the child than the word of God, and it's important to adults as well. We need it. And yet so many people will find something else to do than to read the Word of God, memorize the Word of God. They begin to feel like they can live very well without it. It's a sad, sad mistake. You see, it's what gives them strength in times of trouble. That's why people are, are so medicated today. I've got to have something to, to, to dull me, to, to somehow get me through this issue. God says, no, you need to grow. You need to grow strong in the word of God so you can handle these issues when they come your way. All the world will give you an alternative. But we, 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 we become indifferent to the word. We, we end up rejecting it, number two. They feel by losing their desire for strong biblical preaching. Many Christians want to go through the motions of going to church, but not be moved by God's word to improve their lives. I lay a lot of the problem at the pastor's feet because they know this. They know people do not, many people do not want the word of God that will touch and convict their hearts. And therefore they pacify those people. They accommodate those people. You see, people don't want to be convicted of their sin. So they look for a church where the pastor will, if you will, sanitize his preaching. So no one's ever offended by scripture. That's rejecting truth. And unfortunately, there's pastors out there, many of them, who water down their sermons so as to make the person just feel comfortable and feel good about themselves. But they have not done what God wants his word to do. That's to instruct us and to reprove us and to rebuke us and to change us. To make us into the image of Jesus Christ. 
We can call what we see today Christianity light. And it's the goal of many pastors today. One of the leading topics in churches today is that God wants you rich and wealthy and healthy and wonderful and feel good and being happy. Who doesn't want to hear that? But the fact is, that's not what God wants. God wants to change you. He wants to make you righteous. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to live every day for Him and trust Him and look to Him and allow Him to guide and direct your life. And unfortunately, there's many a church out there that a person can go and go through the motions. I went to church today and oh, how wonderful it was. You've rejected knowledge. God looks right at him and he says, it's my people. They've rejected it. These pastors are more concerned about their attendance and their offerings than they are the souls of the people. They don't even preach on sin. How in the world are you going to get a person saved if you don't tell them they're a sinner? I mean, if God's not saving me from something, why do I even need to be saved? He saves us from hell. He saves us from a, a terrible eternity. Plus, he, he cleanses me of sin. He cleanses you of sin. He forgives you. He puts you in a, a, a position of righteousness. That's what I want. God has promised to his children, I'll take care of your needs. I, I know what you need, you, you have need of before you even ask. He says, don't, don't, those are small things. What I want to do is change you from the inside out. But people don't want that. And as a result, they're part of the problem. They're part of the threat to America. Thirdly, they fail by desiring man's approval over God's approval. You see, many Christians still are ashamed to be recognized as Christians. They seek their lost friend's approval over the approval of God. In other words, when I'm out with my friends, I'm afraid to let them know I'm a Christian. How are you going to change a person's life? How are you going to have impact upon their life if they don't even know you're a Christian? Well, I'm just going to act like they do. I'm going to do the things they do. I'm going to talk the way they do. I'm just going to kind of blend in. You'll never... You'll never affect their life in a positive way for Christ. You're a, you're a threat to, to the to overall cause. I like what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1.10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So how can we expect to be blessed of God when we're ashamed to identify with him? Why would we not want to help our fellow man come to know the same Christ that we know? But so often, we're more concerned about how they see us than how God sees us. Also, they feel by loving sin and pleasure more than God. This has always been a stumbling block for Christians. As a Christian, we have to war against the sinful flesh and desires, don't we? When God saves us, <laughs> I wish you'd take away the sinful desires, but he doesn't. He gives you the power to overcome it. That's what he wants. He could remove it, but he doesn't. He says, I want you to depend upon me to overcome Satan. That gives him glory. Just to remove it 
is not the same glory that he gets by you every day and, and me every day going to him and saying, God, I need your strength today. I need power from the Holy Spirit. God, help me to be able to deal with these temptations and trials that come my way. God gets glory out of that. He loves that. He wants to assist you. He wants to be there for you and help you. But you see, so many people love the sin and the pleasure more than they love God. Even though we have to war against sinful flesh and sinful desires all the time, true Christians will hate it when they give in to sin. They're quick to repent. They ask God for strength not to do it again. The Apostle Paul said, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't have the mind to sin. And those who have the mind of Christ are disgusted when they do sin. A true Christian does not want to be told that it's okay with God that they sin. And yet again, that's even in pulpits today. God doesn't care if you sin. God's a God of love. He's a God of grace. He doesn't care. Yes, he does. He hates sin. That's the very reason that Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's to save sinners. Sin is repulsive to God. And this is why so many flee from the word of God that commands them to abstain from unrighteousness of any kind. Turn to another scripture verse, if you would. Romans chapter 6. Because this is important. If this is stopping God's blessing upon our country, we need to correct it. I think you'd agree with me on that. If we, if we become the threat more than the, 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 the problem solver, then we need to deal with us. Here's what Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What are you saying? Of course not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Jump down to verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. He said, don't, don't let sin run through and control you, dominate you, and dictate to you how you're going to live your life. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's receiving knowledge. That's receiving the word of God. That's acting upon the word of God. That's what God wants us to do. Once we see our deficiency and what we're doing wrong, the Word of God instructs us and helps us to correct our behavior. Next one, they fail, to, they fail by embracing the teachings of the lost over the teachings of the infallible Word of God. Many Christians will read books that instruct them the very opposite of what the Bible says. America has traveled so far down that path that it's nearly impossible for it to return morally to where it was 100 or 150 years ago. We have, we have so far strayed from the moral integrity that we're supposed to be walking that it's almost impossible to go back and get it all. We're that far. Sometimes we think, wow, we're pretty good. No, no, no. Go back 150 years ago and see how they lived, morally. You want to see how, go on back 200 years if you want. I mean, Christianity was a part of their everyday life. They even talked in a Christian language. We are so far removed from where we were 150 years ago, you can't go back and get it all. We're just... 
Can we hang on to the fringes is where we are today because our culture has changed us generation after generation after generation. We've become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. How's that happen? We've listened to lost people more so than the infallible word of God. We've, instruct, we've been instructed in school from people in high places, respected authors, even clergy, what they believe should be an acceptable standard by which to live, even if it conflicts with the word of God. They tell you how they believe and what they think God should accept. And the sinful nature buys into that. And we do it. And we live like that. The unbelieving are still trying to shape the way Christians should live. Did any of you see the article this week? Matter of fact, I think I have it up here. Atheist group tries to purge military command of Christian voices. This is just another one of the voices. Another one of the lost making inroads into Christian values and people. And many people will read that or listen to their side of it and say, well, I think that's right. Let me give you some insight on this little article here. United States Air Force Brigadier General John Titchert is the latest target for the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, an atheistic group dedicated to launching legal attacks against Christians in the military. The anti-religion group founded by Mickey Weinstein has sent a legal demand letter to Secretary of Defense General Mattis asking that General John Titchert, who currently commands the 412th wing, Test Wing at Edwards Air Force Base in California, be stripped of his command and arrested. Wow. Wow. Maybe they found an unclassified email server in his basement, you think? <laughs> Maybe he's got some thousands of emails missing that China has. Probably. Oh, no. No, when you read on, that's not the issue at all. The group's legal counsel relies largely upon statements found on the general's personal website vague complaints from anonymous airmen. Such statements are these. He, uh, in a press release, he has said this, I would ask for your prayers for wisdom in my life of leadership and discernment and understanding and knowledge for influence over the nation's senior leaders that I get to rub shoulders with. My desire is to maximize my impact upon people in our country for the Lord. Fire that guy. Why? Because he mentioned the Lord. The group also finds fault with Titchert when he writes, and this is a personal thing that he wrote, I came to Lancaster Baptist Church in December 2002 for the first time. My wife and I were looking for a church, and we found a good ad for Lancaster Baptist in the Yellow Pages, so we visited, and were immediately made to feel welcome at home, and we enjoyed what I now know as a balance of grace and truth. Ooh, that's scary, isn't it? Strangely, of course, the, uh, those that are attacking him, Weinstein's demand letter accused him, the general of slamming American society at large. What did he say that would slam American society at large? Here's what the general said. He says, I'm concerned about our country's drift away from the foundation on which we were built. I personally believe that those who call themselves Christians are largely to blame because we failed to stand up for the cause of Christ in our country. Amen to him. We have, prayed, we have failed to pray. We have failed to put into practice the principle of 2 Chronicles 
on our watch. We've allowed our country to slip away from its founding Christian principles while it has become increasingly intolerant of Christianity. I don't have a problem with a thing he said. Matter of fact, I commend him. But I'm saying to you, this is the threats that we have to America. They're bringing suit against him, demanding the general be fired and stripped. Not of something that he's done bad, but something he's done good. In 1892, in a case before the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court expressed these words. No purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, There is a single voice making this affirmation. We are a Christian people, and and, and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity. That's exactly true. Dwight D. Eisenhower served as our 34th president. He made this observation about the relationship between religion and government. He said, without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first and most basic expression of Americanism. How in the world can you find fault with some general standing up for Christianity? But they do. We're fighting a tremendous battle. And unless we embrace the knowledge of God's word and stand on the knowledge of God's word, we're going under. President Barack Obama Obama repeatedly asserted that the United States is no longer a Christian nation. However, he never defined what he meant by that statement or the source of his information. A Gallup poll in 2017 said that three-quarters, 75% of Americans identify with the Christian faith. However weakly that might be, but I'm simply saying to you that America still identifies as Christian. And for a general to speak about Christianity and Jesus and our Lord and God, there's nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, it's what's going to bring the blessings of God back on America. And fourthly, they failed, or sixthly, or whatever the number, they failed to properly fear God. Christians need to fear God because it keeps them from acts of evil. We've lost our fear of God. We just think tomorrow will be another day, nothing bad is going to happen. Israel thought the same thing until disaster came. Israel was overrun. Judah was overrun. The Syrians defeated them. The Babylonians defeated them. Took them into slavery. How could that be? How could God do that to his people? Because they forsook him. And he says, I will let you go too. Who do we think that we are so good that we can deny God and forget God and let, get him out of our families and out of our lives and still expect him to watch over us and protect us. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 6, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Let me quickly give you the solution. We'll close. What's the solution to this threat? You still have Hosea? Let's go back to Hosea, and I will conclude. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Now, God has told them in chapter 4, verse 6, Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. 
But he comes up with a solution. I, I'm so glad God always has a solution. You know, there's always hope with God. That's what's wonderful about God. In Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, this is God speaking. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. All right, God says, that's the way you want to be. You don't want me. You're not interested in my word anymore. You don't want strong preaching. You don't want to be convicted of sin. You don't even want me a part of your life. That's fine. I'll go, step back. I'll kind of get out of sight. But affliction's coming. And I'll let you deal with it until you can't handle it anymore and you start crying out, oh, God, where are you? Oh, God says, oh. Did I hear something? Did I hear something? You didn't want me. Now you want me. You see, a little affliction will always do that. My dad taught me that. <laughs> you want to you be rebellious, son? It's going to cost you. Oh, dad. Oh. <laughs> I learned that pain can motivate. And God says, in their affliction, what's he say? In their affliction, they'll seek me early. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. Things are so bad. But I thought you were going to do it yourself. You didn't need my help. You didn't care. Matter of fact, you rejected me. But God simply states the truth. That when the afflictions come, we'll turn to God. And then he says in chapter 6, verse 1, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. That's the God that we serve. We have a God of mercy, compassion. But I'm saying... If we want to be blessed of God, we must include God into our lives. We must begin to, right now, I'm going to live for God every day. His word is going to be an important role in my life, my family's life. I'm going to bring my children up to honor his word. I'm going to put him first in my life. I'm going to set an example. I'm going to stand on the truth of God's word. I don't want to be one who rejects it. And boy, I tell you what, when God sees that in your life, in the next person's life, in the next person's life, God's going to do some blessing. Right now, God has given this little window of grace that we have. But we're close to the very end. God told Israel that he's willing to bestow a pardon on them. Restore the relationship they previously enjoyed if they'd only repent. Which meant what? Acknowledge their sinfulness. Seek God in forgiveness. Demonstrate a willingness to return to the Lord by turning away from sinful acts and behavior. Turn themselves over to God and God says, I'll bind you up and I'll make you whole. So our greatest need today is simply for a personal national revival. We want to live for God. Then we have to ask God for his strength to help us. Make the changes necessary in, his life, in our lives. We've just simply got to get back to honoring his word, desiring his word, and living by his word. It's simply suicide for America to try to be successful without God. The final verse, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door knock, Jesus says. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. Will you do what God wants you to do? Stand with me, please. I'll stay in the old time way. The way that believes in Jesus. For he makes the lost sinners brand new.
شام